Okay, welcome everybody to the sixth session. Probably the most important part of uh, business. Oh, Stuart laughs. You have come here, most important. Not because I came, because business development, it's arguable. Is it the uh, work that you do that's more important, or is that the work that the BDs bring in that's more important? It's catch-22. It's an ongoing discussion between uh, marketing and sales guys, too. Do you, can you make sales without marketing? Can you uh, do sales without the other way, right? So today's uh, session six is business development and capture management. And uh, this was on our agenda for about a few months. And since last month, I've been thinking about it and I've been actually talking to different people, asking questions, what is business development? And it's a tough one. Business development is not easily defined. So I thought I'd open it up with a little exercise with all of you and have some uh, stimulating thoughts about what you think BD is. And if you have any questions, maybe we could jot it down. And maybe during the presentation, it'll come out somewhere between my presentation and Rick's. If not, it'll be something uh, like a homework that we will address uh, down the line. So. Question is, what do you think development, dev, uh, business development is? Golfing. What is it? Golfing. Golfing. <laughs> BD is. Golfing. And Ben, serious? <laughs> yeah, a lot of networking. Networking. Client relationship. Yeah, which is networking. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's one aspect of networking. Yeah. Client relationship. Client relationship building and maintaining them. Building maintain uh, finding project needs. Project needs. Oh, sorry. Yep. Finding this pen's dying. Can I put it in here? Strategizing. Formulating a strategy, strategizing. You said a team. Balancing the Wow. Balancing risk versus war. Someone's an academic, huh? No. <laughs> Rick, here's a whole bunch. Anything to add, Peter? Oh, Peter added RFP. Well, the, only, the only thing I'd add is, is that it's looking way ahead. Looking ahead? Way ahead. I had a distinction between BD and marketing. Okay. <coughs> BD versus marketing. Does anybody want any explanation on any of these things? Like, let's say BD and marketing? BD versus marketing? Because we will touch upon that. Strategizing, we'll touch upon that. We'll touch a little bit on that, on go and no-go discussion that we'll have. Looking way ahead, I guess it's somewhere in there. Client relation, and uh, what network is coming up, project leads. Yeah, so most of the these are in there, including golfing. But win rate. Or win rate? Projected win rate. BD is projected win rate. There's so many elements. Basically, that's what it comes down to. Projected win rate. Is outreach part of the marketing, or is that part of it? Question, huh? I think it's in there. Okay. Pro provide good service. So it goes all over. Projecting, looking ahead, uh, networking with your uh, client or your colleagues, all the way to uh, finding success, success in your pursuit. It covers a wide gamut. 
the interesting conversation that I uh, had with some VD folks about business development is it's developing business and that's how he wanted to uh, just let you know it's a plain word business development but if we get into the nutty gritty of it it's a how how do you do it what's the process what's your experience what do you uh, pick up as uh, tips or tricks of the trade if you will and be able to apply this whether you are a BD person operation person like Sylvia or uh, engineers like yourself and especially PM. So doing BD as a PM will uh, hopefully will highlight is an important thing. So you're not a BD person but you are a PM and there's opportunity for you to implement business development into the role that you play. Hmm? Business development is developing business, right? The only other thing I would add is yeah. research investigation. Research, I'll just put it up here. And that's about project or? It could be about project, it could be about a client. It could be about being knowledgeable before you reach out. Yep, Intel's right. Overall market in general. Market, market in general. Well, the specific issue that you're looking at. Right. So more specific than we just did. Yeah. So what is a seller doer? What does seller doer mean? So that would be part of that old PM being an opportunity to uh, uh, come up. Maybe we'll uh, write it down and address it. So most of us, I think most of us are uh, doers. Would you, would you agree? Maybe Peter, Rick are selling, Travis is out there trying to, and Marco is uh, working on uh, getting the RFP. So I guess there are certain capacity of selling on our part, right? When we get involved in the RFP, but actively uh, having that as a primary responsibility to really try to sell a project, bring the project in, and then you actually deliver. Uh, we have uh, less, less emphasis from you guys at this time but we would like to move in that direction because there is an advantage of the technical folks who are actual doers who are able to better sell than a guy who's just going there and doing a lot of talking and trying to sell okay uh, the first thing that I put in there's a four is a it's a key word and Ben was not uh, too far off in saying uh, golfing yeah I do like golfing when I was a kid, when I was in uh, high school, my father wanted to uh, teach me to uh, golf. He was a businessman, and he said, Roy, when you grow up, and if you're going to be a businessman one day too, you're going to have to learn how to golf. So he wanted to get me up at 5 o'clock in the morning, go to a range, and start hitting balls at that age. Well, when you're 16, golf is not that exciting, nor getting up at 6 o'clock is very exciting. So I opted not to learn golf back then. And I never really understood why business and golf. Can anybody say why business and golf is so associated closely or associated? Ben, since you brought that up. Uh, High-end rollers. You know. High-end rollers. <laughs> because uh, when, once, once they hit the ball, yeah. they walk, they talk, uh -huh. they eat, you know, everything is... Yeah. During that time? Yeah. Yes. What do you think? What else? So when everyone's guards down, everyone's just having a good time talking. There's that uh, component, things. certainly. There is, you're, you're not in a familiar, different territory, different environment. So you end up uh, engaging personally with that individual. What I like about that whole, why I put that in there, is an important point. When you are locked in four to five hours with this guy, riding cart, looking for ball, every single one together, it just naturally progresses into who they are, what they do, and it just progresses into conversation of work. You don't have to work that hard to try to engage in what my purpose is, trying to develop business and market. It just creates that environment. And then it's that whole spending time together, letting the guard down, 
having a drink and being able to make that connection. The second point of that golf to me is making the connection with that individual at a different level. And when you make that connection, then it's easy to talk about subjects that you want to bring up. The second point in business development, and somebody brought it up, uh, BD and marketing. Well, I put sales and marketing, and I uh, lured, lured to that in the beginning. There are things that we do to let our company know, and I could go out to lunch with Rick four times, five times, and Gilbert golf for four or five times, and meet with the neck for four times, and it's just letting them know about the company that I work for versus actually moving that step to another level to bring it to a BD level, bring it to a sales level. So it can't be just the surface meeting between me and the client and me and the colleague and end it at that, but there is another level of relationship that you want to get to. That person has something to buy, I have something to sell. That person has something to offer to me, something that I could capture, and we need to look for that opportunity and be able to pass on it, right? When we're going out to BD, it's different than just networking different than just meeting. There's got to be a different purpose. And that's the uh, fourth point. I'm, let me just skip over because it fits. When you meet with a client, when I meet with a client, it's not just meeting with that individual. That's not the agenda. Agenda is, I want to know about his project or her project. I want to know about what his outlook is, his strategy, and be able to hone in on getting the information, intel, right, from that individual early as I can. And I think that's a big key strategy. Looking way ahead and being able to investigate and research and find information early on will give us an advantage in being able to take our relationship to development management level. <coughs> Simple enough, I think, right? So these are the tricks of the trades that I think uh, I started jotting down. And uh, Rick helped me formulate some of these things. And this is where we could have uh, your wealth of information too. So we could share with each other what are some of the things that I learned that are effective and that's helpful. That Making that connection with that individual is important to me. If I came up right up to you and say, hey, what project do you have going on in your city? It's not as going to be effective if I see you the third time and I remember you're having some shoulder pains, let's say. It's a small minor thing, but for me to connect to that, so if I connect to that person humanly, then it's easier for me to en engage that person in business too, and it could come out more smoothly. First thing is names, and some people say names, I have a hard time doing it, but if you really need it, you will be get, you, you'll, you'll get good at remembering names. You'll jot down notes, you'll have it in your address book, you will figure out to call that person by the correct name. And we all make efforts to doing that, and we know how important that is. Calling that individual by name. I, from my side, when someone remembers me and my company, and that I do civil structural, and I'm DBE, the more information they remember about me, makes me feel much better. I, I did my job, that person knows me, I feel we bonded, so then I engage in the conversation, whether it's networking or lunch or golf or wherever we are. So names, I think, is important, okay? Who's who, uh, who's who was Rick's word? Uh, oh, finding out the intel about that person, what that person does, what the organization is like, what's the role that they play. Finding information is important. That who's who is uh, how you are uh, network with everybody. I know Rick from uh, RBF days, and when he was running the western uh, side of Mississippi for Michael Baker. Knowing him, <laughs> gives me an advantage when I talk to Peter, who knows Michael Baker to be a very respectable, uh, very respectable company. For me to know people and to be able to make that connection, dropping names, dropping names doesn't sound 
you know, sounds so uh, suave or sounds so uh, noble, but knowing other people and being able to make that connection gives people comfort. I walk up to Travis and Travis doesn't know me, but as soon as I say, hey, I golf with Rick and I am a good friend of him, he and I work together. It gives that individual sense of comfort because that relationship brings me to elevate to that type of level, or at least the opportunity to be taken a little bit more serious. So that's, uh, networking is an important thing and being able to associate making that connection for people would be a helpful thing. You might want to add to that because I kind of stumbled there because the who's who threw me no, off. No, I got it. You, you just got to know what role, I think you nailed it in the beginning, mm -hmm. what role each person plays in their company because you're really trying to get to decision makers. And so if you're talking to some people who can't connect you, you have to think, am I really spending my time in the, in the best place? So sort of like a tribal knowledge, people, people get close to each other if they belong to the same tribe. Mm -hmm. When they have that uh, relationship, uh, then they kind of belong. It's also for the network effects. Network effects. So I'm a, in the same network with you, you, you lend me more trust in the conversation. I see. Okay. Four or five touches is important in the uh, BD trade because when you are actually uh, pursuing a project, and we have, we've been guilty of responding to RFP when it hits the street. But we want to be able to have four or five touches before the RFP comes out with the PM of that city or for that agency. We want to be able to visit that individual. We want to run into them at a networking event. We want to sit next to that person at a, a WTS luncheon. We want to reach out to that individual, email, say, hey, can I? Whatever it takes, four or five touches. It could be you or it could be the company, but we need to be able to have that intersect interaction before we are uh, be able to uh, find success towards the end of uh, end of uh, a cycle of PD and actual pursuit. Latest information goes back to Intel. You know? How much information can I get? Th things like. Is this a funded project? When's the RFP coming out? Who's the lead agency? What are the stakeholders? What are the challenges? How big is the project? What phase is it at? Who's the PM? Every information that you could get on that project is needed. The latest information talks about getting the latest information from wherever you get, whether it's a colleague or direct from agency. That is a value that you bring to the prime or to your colleagues when you talk. Everybody knows that 405 design build is going on on a pursuit. But to be able to say the lead designer is so-and-so, the PM is so-and-so, the estimated cost is so-and-so, and it's the latest accurate information elevates uh, your credibility and elevates your position when you're dialoguing, engaging in people. So getting latest information is important. And I think we touched on that somewhere. Uh, have a list of items. So uh, who, what, where, cost, all of that, all the information that you could gather about the project is going to be uh, very instrumental. And you want to have those things at the uh, fingertips so that you're able to speak on it, right? Uh, trip, and the tricks of the chain. When we're meeting people, uh, I, uh, my first uh, bullet was to make a good impression, make that connection with people. I keep saying connection. This is Rick's uh, refined bullet, and you have one chance to make first impression. And I thought that was very poignant, more poignant than how I put it. When we encounter people out there in their work, they'll see you, and then you, whether you develop that relationship, and what kind of relationship you develop person, happens at a very first meeting when you meet. And you only get tensed at once. If you go to a networking event and you're just uh, drinking it up and you are just a mess, that's the first impression that you leave with that individual for a long time. And to undo that is a real difficult process. And most likely it won't because that person has that impression of who you are. So the first impression, the first meeting is very important. My Again, my attempt 
is to make a human connection with that individual rather than a business connection. To find more about that individual, share more about me, that allows that person to connect humanly. Right? And I think that's something that I picked up and I like to uh, go after. Something that I think uh, I have gotten feedback from people, and nicer way of saying it is that I'm persistent, but it's, it's a, something that I do on purpose when I go out and network and meet people for the purpose of that. So I have an agenda of what I want to accomplish with this individual who has a project coming up. I get a chance to talk about it briefly, and that's not going to do it. That's the first touch or second touch. I need to have that one-on-one -on -one or one-in-four group of uh, presentation where I need to have more in-depth. And in order for me to get that, I need to open that door to say, hey, I want to follow up with you so that I could talk more about this project. And then this is, I think, what I do. I say, I just give myself permission saying, can I follow up with you? I will follow up with you in two weeks, within two weeks, about this to set up and get on your calendar. Maybe we could grab lunch or I could come by your office. But I left the door open to give my permission to follow up. And an important thing is actually following up. That following up after a meeting, exchanging business cards, is a, it's, it does wonders to follow up. And you will see when you begin to receive follow-up emails from people, it takes time, it takes conscious effort to do another task in your busy schedule and to uh, accomplish that. That's good. And then second, if that happens the first time, I do it in the email. I know you're busy. I understand you. So if you don't respond to this email, I will follow up again in a couple of weeks as a gentle reminder. And then I will follow up again and say, hey, this is a gentle reminder. And being persistent and following like that eventually for me pays off because that is you're committed to catering to that individual, that person understands that you're patiently waiting, and then be able to make that connection. And when that meeting happens, again, you want to have a very clear agenda. Now, you are demonstrating that you know about that project. You just want that FaceTime for marketing purposes, as well as a little bit of insight. You don't want to go and say, hey, I don't know anything about that project. Can you tell me everything about that project so I could start pursuing? You want to do your homework, get that intel, look ahead, get all the details, and be able to hone in. When you take to that level of knowing all the general stuff, then we are meeting about that project, you have 30 minutes left, the client is going to begin to talk about things that he didn't hear. So, oh, you didn't uh, mention about the railroad, da 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 and that's going to take a heavy coordination effort, and they'll begin to offer added values that become your intel, and that helps you uh, better success down the line. In the Roy, can I yes. add one thing on that? Because I know you do this, but this is all about having our list and asking people. But one of the important techniques is that there's a term, it's a technique called Mandeville. It's named after a guy. I might jot it down and look it up later. But it has to do with asking questions of your client. So, or your potential client. So for example, not about the project, but what you might say is, hey, what are some of the things that, that you find troublesome with civil engineers you work with? So you can get some insight into what are some of their hot buttons and irritations, or what when somebody did a good job for you, what was it that stood out? And you can sort of quiz because now, at some point you might be doing an RF or a, a statement of qualifications, and so not only do you know about the project, but you know about the clients' um, hot buttons and how you might appeal to them a little greater. So it's basically asking questions and then listening, letting them talk. Okay. Very good. So I've asked Peter uh, this many times before too. What is the uh, one project that kind of uh, was a turning point for us, right? And Expo 2, I think, is one of the projects out there that had uh, elevated our level of design, qu uh, quality, size, company size, the whole entire thing. And I put it in there because this is a story that just not just one project, but we built up to it and then we catapulted off of it. 
And I think that's why I wanted to share this story. And it begins with an uh, opportune, op it just became a chance where we got to be involved with a company called MZT, Macro Z. And they were a smaller general contractor who did design build out at the US Navy facilities. Like what we are doing right now, they're on the contract side. And somehow, I forget how, but we picked up some opportunity to be the architecture of record. So we did civil, structural, electrical, uh, geotechnical, whole spectrum of, and we, we stamped the whole uh, design, and we had a first military design build. Actually, off of that, we had two or three tasks of having a design build. And we took that new experience, and we were able to leverage, or we were able to really strong our people in the uh, Expo uh, Metro side, and told them that we have design build experience. Design build was just happening at that time. We took our new experience out in the US Navy, which is a small project, and we tackled a, a large design build of Expo 2. We had Expo 1, which was doing some independent check, but we were on the design build team. But Macro Z, small project, we were able to say we were the designer of record. We led it, multidiscipline, and we leveraged that. And we leveraged that to the designer first, the WSP, and then we leveraged that to the contractor, uh, Skanska. Mike Opericcio, he's known as an $8 billion man in the uh, city of LA because he has three major projects that he won. Before he won any of those, we approached him. Peter and I drove out to Riverside. Here's two small guys who done uh, biggest project was probably Expo One independent check for less than a quarter million. And talking to Mike Capriccio, who's an $8 billion man to be, and he was looking at all these mega metro projects. We sat down with him. He chided us for not reading some of the uh, reports that's been published at Metro, but we were focused on this particular project, and he quizzed us, and he was impressed enough to go back to the uh, WSP or PB at that time and told them to give us a try. So I went to PB first, laid out the interest, and then we went to Skanska, who gave us the thumbs up and referred us back to PB. So then you did your uh, pre-marketing, pre-sales with your PB, and Skanska only approved it, and we were able to get on uh, the PB's team. And then they, uh, I remember that phone call in the NIM office on that moment when Brett called, he wanted us to be exclusive and he offered half of the structures on that project. So as a small guy, we just looked at each other and said, is this what we want to do? And we nodded and saying, yeah, we're going to be exclusive with you, Brett. And then we got on the team and then we participated, not waited for the project to be awarded, but we participated in the entire pursuit, in the preliminary engineering, dividing up the scope, talking about innovation. We were very involved in the early part of that. And then we became, after that, the expo, what we call a small business design build export. Expo 2, Regional Connector, Westside, MSC, and we're pursuing Purple Line 3, Purple Line 3 Tunnel, Purple Line 3 Station, East Side, Light Rail uh, up north. So we took an opportune chance and we pre-sold and we marketed and we were involved in the early pursuit and deliver at the end. Those are important steps that I wanted to make. Is the we're able to deliver, like Marwan said, proven good service allows us to take that resume to the next team to do that. And the early teaming, early pursuit, I can never emphasize in the BD, the earlier you pursue, the earlier you team, the earlier you prepare, the higher the success should be, the higher chance that you will have in securing a project. Expo 2, before it was out on the street as a small firm, we were able to maneuver in that manner to be able to find a great success. And I think that is one of the pillars of projects that had uh, elevated us. So Expo 2 has a good element. That's motor. <laughs> no, that's not motor. no? Not motor? I thought I labeled it as motor. 
That's 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 not motor? That's national. That's a station, too. So that's just the rendering. We should be able to. Oh, there's, it's right up there. <laughs> so Expo 2, in my mind, has a lot of good elements. And we continue to uh, look to that to be able to find. When I uh, uh, met Mike, it was so intimidating. And I was talking to a lot of his deputies, too. So when I met Mike, I, it was, it's an easy name, but I could only think of Ben, who I was talking to, get to Mike, so I called him Ben. You know what I mean? I didn't call Mike Mike. And then, huh? So name is important. But for him, that kind of struck, oh, the guy that who could remember my name. And he was able to engage. Mike, to this day, when I see him at a restaurant, he'll say, hey, Roy, what's going on? Because he's just a $8 billion man, but he still remembers all these subs. Along with that, we saved him uh, quite a few million dollars in our design, too, the Kenter Canyon. So there are a lot of elements in Expo 2 that's a success. So more we could talk about it, more we could learn. So I share that story uh, up to here, and we want to get to an exercise, and Rick's going to lead us through that phase. We want to be prepared when we meet our client, colleagues, or our subs, so that we do the best representation. And it came up in our discussion that we need to perhaps uh, have an elevator speech uh, ready. Um, when I met with a recent uh, uh, general contractor, they kept asking me, he kept honing on the same question over and over again and kept diving into different layers about me. Right? And I realized I've only have prepared to talk about PACRIM, Civil structural, small DBE firm that we serve, da, 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 but not really get down to. He wanted to get to know me, but I wasn't ready to have a quick elevator speech ready for him about me. He wanted to know about me. This, uh, I think, is an important thing that we should have readily available because when we encounter people, it's a short window and you want to be very effective, effective as much as you can, right? So uh, I invited Rick to be participating and leading us in this point, portion. It's on. We'll leave it on. Thank you. Okay, so elevator speech, you might hear it called elevator pitch, but it's the same thing. And and why why do you think it's called that? Why isn't it called an elevator speech? Short. Short. Probably. That's May maybe. Maybe. You start, <laughs> yeah. lower, you know, your speech is kind of low profile and you augment and you escalate that uh, speech and the pitch to, to make a positive impact on them. I hadn't thought of that, yeah. but I like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but the, the genesis of it is you get in the elevator on the 12th floor and another guy walks in too and you recognize the guy or you don't, but you hear somebody say something, you've got from the 12th floor to the first floor to, to get your point out and to do what Roy said, which is get permission at the end to contact them again. So you don't have much of a window. So that's, that's where it comes from. Now, if you're in the Empire State Building, you could have a much longer <laughs> elevator speech. You might be in there for a while. <clears throat> and then it might be an elevator essay, you know, but. Um, so why is it important? Because it's about opportunity. Something presents itself, and they say elevator. Don't think of it as only the elevator. The same thing happens if you go to a business lunch, you know, a professional association, and you have maybe 60 seconds or less that you're going to shake somebody's hand and have a quick word with them because everybody else is waiting to talk to them or they're on their way out. So it's, it's just that, that little opportunity that you see open up in front of you, and you want to make your best shot. And if you just say, hi, I'm so-and-so, with uh, yeah, nice day. And you get to the bottom, you, you just lost the opportunity. <laughs> and so, you know, do you really expect to sell something from the 12th floor down to the first floor? You're not gonna close a sale. But like Roy said, and it's such an important point about having permission for a follow-up contact. I read a book called Never Eat Alone. I'm not even going to say I like the whole book that much, but he has a lot of points about that follow-up. And his example was he's at a conference and the guest speaker has just finished and everyone's attacking this guy and they all want to dominate the guy's time. And of course the speaker is going, hey, he's 
talking, you know, get off. He's, he wants to, when he makes his you know, introduction, he wants to be able to say, I'm so-and-so, I do these things, and hey, do I, would it be okay if I called your secretary next week and set up a time? And the guy says, yeah, sure. Now he, and he's done, he's out of the guy's way. But now when he calls that office, he can say, I met so-and-so at this, and he told me to give you a call. And so he's worked his way in the door. <laughs> so, next slide. <laughs> So let's talk about the elements of an elevator speech. You'll see different versions of this, but in the end, they're all gonna deliver you the same, the same deal. It's, there's a what, what are we? So we wanna make sure that when we meet someone that, that we're clear about who we are, what we are. Who, you gotta think about the who, who am I talking to? It's kind of a know your audience. And to that end, and to Roy's point before about he had a, a message he wanted to get, but the guy was probing him about personal things. In reality, you have to have multiple elevator speeches. If I bump into a guy who I know is a land developer, I'm gonna tell him something different about Packram than I am if I bump into the director of public works. And we'll get into that a little more. <clears throat> so the wow, somewhere in this wow, you've gotta be able to catch somebody in a, in a couple of phrases about What's intriguing about your company? Or, you know, whether it's something really unusual you've done, something that differentiates you, or it's something that a number of things you've done, or dollars you save somebody on a particular project they might be familiar with. You want to have something that you know raises their eyebrows a little bit. <clears throat> the why. So here's this fact I just gave you, but the why is what does that mean to you? So you've got to be able to connect it to something you might do for them. And then, uh, again, consistent with Roy's comment, create the follow-up action. So I'm going to give you an example elevator speech or pitch. And let's just say this is not refined, but you get the idea. <coughs> Excuse me. I would, um, I would refine this a lot more and be able to deliver this in more more common lingo. But I'm, I'm somewhere at a, you know, where I have an opportunity to meet somebody and say, hi, I'm, I'm Rick Rubin, I'm a principal with Packram Engineering. And he's, of course, it's a two-way thing. What do you guys do? Well, our key focus is solving our clients' challenges relating to infrastructure design and construction. Our sweet spot is civil and structural engineering with a priority of supporting clients by providing cost-effective constructible designs for roads, highways, rail, drainage, water, wastewater facilities, and things of that nature. High profile clients such as LA Metro, Port of Long Beach, and the US Navy to name a few, they see the hands-on involvement of our principals and our senior people, and they know they're getting the benefit of many years of experience on their projects, unlike a lot of other larger firms. Our large clients with significant programs such as Northrop Grumman, they've seen this firsthand, and they continue to expand our work based on our initial performance. I, I'd love the opportunity to give you a call early next week so we, I can learn more about your needs and maybe suggest ways that we can help you. Now I would, like I said, I would refine that significantly. If I ran into a developer, I really don't want to tell them about, about my work with LA Metro, Port of Long Beach, and US Navy. I want to tell them about my work with um, with with um, with a developer, and I would you know want to be able to say yeah, Toll Brothers. We did for Toll Brothers. We've done this and that. Or I would accentuate our connections with government um, staff is is enabled us to really slide things through, approvals through quickly. You got to have something that resonates with each client. So I'm going to just take a moment because I want you to look at this little handout here. If you would, I should have gotten that out to you already. And this is, like I said, there's a lot of other things that could be in here. <clears throat> but I want you to just see the elements of this thing. We can peek over there. So you can see there, there's a what. And the what in this one, in this case, is Packram. Talking about what we are. You know, what, a little bit about the company. So that's the what here. The who, we're trying to make a connection to who they are. So by by citing some similar clients that we serve, he gets immediately gets an impression that, that we've offered those services to people like and entities like theirs. In this case, the wow, 
and the wow could be a lot different, but in this case, it has to do with hands-on involvement. And I actually, the DBE would have been a good thing to, to why are you hands-on? You know, the nature of our DBE business is that our, we're very hands-on. But something that makes them go, oh, I'm gonna get, I'm really gonna get the senior guy and not get pushed off. That's what you're trying to <coughs> give them. And then, so that's the wow. The why, you know, what's, so what does that mean? You got these senior people. Well, they're getting the benefit of, of that experience on their project directly, not just by advising some another staff member. And then the when has to do with that follow-up action, that request to, and there'd be a card exchange and all those things, or a note. One, one other trick I've learned on the cards, especially when you're out and about and you collect four of them, when you talk to someone, write on the back of the card what you talked about. Follow up on um, roadway design for, you know, and then when you see it, go, oh, I knew who that guy was. I had a guy work for me once who wanted to go to a, it's called a pumpers conference, but it's a place where if you're doing pipeline assessment, there, you can go there and there's a lot of public works directors around. And so you can talk to people and there's not many competitors there about what you can do for them, for compliance, for for sewer pipes and things like that under municipal regulation, or under you know regulations for discharge. <laughs> so he comes back and he says, yeah, I met this guy and he his city, they've got some serious problems and they could really use some help um, doing some closed circuit TV work on that. And I said, oh, who is he? And he goes, oh God, what was that guy's name again? Ah. Uh, and I'm going, oh, this is a really effective trip to Michigan. You know, he did not know the guy's name, did not, could not sort that guy's card from anybody else's. In other words, he had this, this guy has this great need and someone else will fulfill it. You know, because he just wasn't jotting the notes on the card and knowing who's who. So um, I think you can see what we have there. And so why don't we, let's go, uh, let's see, one more slide, Roy, if we might. So let's talk about, um, before we do this exercise, I want to talk quickly about things to avoid. So one of, one of the things to avoid is, remember, you've only got a short amount of time and a lot of clients have short attention span. So you don't want to be floundering for, you know, what exactly do we do? You know, what's our sweet spot? Um, you want to share, you know, th these people um, share everything they do, hoping something will stick instead of staying tight to their message. And it projects a sense of desperation. It's not very attractive. I'll give you an example. Somebody says, what do you do? Oh, I do a lot of things. I've done lots of sales training in the past, but lately lots of my customers have been asking me to do facilitation. I'm really good at helping companies launch new products. And you're going, what do you do? You know, and so that, that's not gonna be very helpful. Or, or uh, sometimes I write their marketing copy. Well, sometimes I do PR, it really doesn't matter. I like doing both and I'm good at both. I'm doing this neat project right now for a client. It's mapping the various features for their markets. So I'm into strategy development too. Now, I don't know about you guys, when I get that call on the phone, I'm going, e -e -e -e. you know, there's nothing I heard there that says you're just nothing but a generic salesman. So the other one is, I love my subject rambler. So this is where you're so in love with what you do that you are in the weeds a lot and clients regret asking you what you do and it's just boring. So how about this? What do I do? We do process re-engineering with the various departments, divisions, business units, and subsidiaries from organizations as well as the numerous contractors that provide products and services that go into the development of your own branded and unbranded products. We initially start by doing a comprehensive assessment of the multiple groups involved in the process, covering questions such as dot, 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 you get the idea. Just on and on, and it's like, geez, couldn't you just tell me what you guys do? And how you're gonna save me money? What's the wow there? There, there isn't any. And so you want to really watch out for that. The other thing is the wing it approach. You know, the wing it approach happens if you don't have an elevator speech because someone's asking you, but you will find you'll either go silent or you'll do one of those things that, that I just pointed out. So that's why it's important to have, have some things in mind. And I would say rehearsed, but enough that you've got key bullets in your mind about how to how to touch on those subjects without looking like you're giving a speech. You want to be able to talk about it casually. 
and make that connection. Um, the one in approach you just mentioned, uh, I don't know, one of the more often happened scenario is being silent. Uh, like we go out to a client, for example, um, I mentioned that to, to Marco at the one point at the Vancouver River uh, meeting. When you have given the opportunity, you want to make use of that opportunity, be able to have the elevator speech or the, whatever the speech you are supposed to, as uh, supposed to be silent, be really short, and, uh, and not be able to convey the messages. Right. And then when is uh, have two part of it, one is uh, that is all over the place. Another part, like I just said, is that you don't make use of the opportunity. Right. So there, there's two, two, two different scenarios, there's probably more, but one is you know you're going to a meeting. Now if you know you're going to a meeting, there's absolutely no reason that you shouldn't have something specific to that meeting. You should know about the client. As Roy said, you're doing your homework and you know exactly how to present this. That's what Roy does every meeting he has. He's done his research, he knows what are the key points that are going to resonate with that client on that topic. The, the bump into somebody requires that you have pre-prepared some general elevator speech scenarios so that when you run into someone you can speak to him. If you're going to a military engineer's lunch, you want to be able to talk about the work you do for the military. If you're going to something in transportation, you want to be able to talk about that. So you have to make adjustments, but you have to be clear in your mind about what your key points are before you ever venture out of the building. Because that can that can catch you anywhere. You can be on vacation and have that opportunity sitting in a coffee shop because that's where you meet people everywhere. So, <clears throat> and then the last thing is don't oversell. So people can see right through that. And, and for me, when people are using terms like, oh, this is life changing. Really, it's life changing? You know, why don't I already know about it then if it's that, if it's that big? So you, you don't want to use terms that are going to, that come off so stereotype car salesman like that people are, are, you know, get off, you know, and they, they don't want to talk to you anymore. So what I'd like to do is, let's do a little exercise. And this is everybody's on their own here for a few minutes. I'd like you guys to take about three to five minutes, say five, and write a quick elevator speech. And then we're going to deliver them. Uh, because, you know, there's nothing like, nothing like practice to be able to do it. And, and you guys can decide who your client is, so they don't, I'm not gonna give you any criteria on that, but yeah, you can choose your own time. scenario. So it's easier to hum in the speech. Okay, who, who, wants to, who wants to go first? Could we do by age or height? <laughs> I was gonna say, no, I was just gonna do this. Who from this corner of the table would like to go first? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's you, Gilbert. <laughs> Yeah, this is recorded. Yeah, I got it on. So, so you we'll just keep that with you. All right. Uh, Stand up. Your first elevator. Uh, <laughs> we could even reenact this. Out. Give it, what do you do? <laughs> well, I, uh, is this on? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Stand up. so this is uh, at a port function, I guess, because uh, Peter, Peter gave me the idea. <laughs> um, so just start off, you know, introduce myself. Hello, my name, I'm Gilbert Guevara. I'm a lead uh, design and project manager at PACRIM. Uh, at PACRIM, we pri primarily provide civil and structural engineering services, uh, serving as either prime SBE or support SBE. Uh, we recently uh, primed as, as uh, oh no, we recently served as the prime uh, for the Ports TIY project and uh, I served as a lead structural design manager for a pedestrian bike path at Pier J. Um, we know the ins and outs of the port processes, uh, uh, so I'd love to give you a, a call early next week to go over your needs, what you might need uh, to help in any of future pursuits. It's kind of pretty good. Okay, well, thank generally you. Generally, what it was. Yes, please call. Just had more. <laughs> Had more uh, difficulty yeah. reading my own writing. <laughs> 
Hi, I'm Stor, a senior structural engineer um, uh, with Packerim Engineering. Uh, we provide civil and structural uh, consulting service for public uh, projects, including uh, uh, design and build services, and such as um, a road, a highway, a railway, and water and uh, waste uh, water facility and so on. Uh, our client including uh, LA, Metro, uh, LA Metro, the Port of Long Beach, US Navy, Caltrain, and etc. I, uh, I would like, uh, uh, I would happy to have an opportunity to give a call next, uh, 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 early next week uh, to, to, so you can, you can learn more about us. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. What else? Who next? Ben wants to go last because he's prepared, <laughs> he's prepared for last year's speech. <laughs> Hi, I'm Travis Patal with Packram Engineering. At Packram, we pride ourselves on efficiently designing civil infrastructure projects, including roads, drainage, and stormwater, to meet client project and budgetary needs. We understand processing and approval procedures for surrounding agencies that ultimately help speed up approval process. We also understand the issues you are currently facing with the new stormwater regulations. In fact, we are able to save X client X amount of money on this project, on this X project. We feel we can assist your needs moving forward. Can I speak with you in the next week or so to further explain how we can help you? It was a commercial developer, was the client. I am addressing this uh, to a director of public works at a, an agency in Southern California. Ooh, big so, uh, yeah. My name is Marwan Salhab. I am a project manager at PACREM. We are a civil structural firm that handles the design of a wide range of in infrastructure projects. Some of our clients are Lawa, Metro, uh, municipalities such as West, West Covina and Brea and the naval facilities. As a PM, I have my hands on several projects related to those agencies. Our company has the potential to handle the design of transportation projects. Many of us have worked for different counties in Southern California, including myself. I personally have worked for many years at Riverside County and worked on different capital projects. We look forward to receiving RFPs from your agency and to follow, follow up with you personally. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Ben Cole. I'm the project manager at the design lead for with Pegram Engineering. And uh, I'm sorry. Start over. Move over. Yeah. We want to capture this moment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm Benko. I'm a, a project manager and design lead with Pegrim Engineering. Um, uh, Pegrim's key strength is in the civil and the structural engineering in both uh, PS and E and design build in the highway, rail, uh, water, wastewater, utility, bridge, underground structures, uh, as well as uh, other related services. Um, our high client profiles such as Metro, Caltrans, uh, and Port Long and uh, they, uh, me and my principal are uh, on the, the port really see me and my principal are the one who really work on the project as what we normally uh, specify in uh, this uh, oak chart and, uh, so they, uh, they know that uh, they can trust on us uh, I would like to connect with you next week uh, to learn about uh, your needs and also that introduce ourselves better to you so that we can serve you better I'm oh, sorry I'm going to come next week <laughs> <laughs> Well, Marco, next week. I'm serious, I'm out of town next week. You are? Golfing again? <laughs> uh, this is uh, at a CCA meeting um, with a city engineer. 
Um, hey Mike, how are you? Uh, how are things going in the city? And then he kind of asked me to remind him uh, who I'm with again. I'm with uh, Pacrim Engineering. We are a DBE specializing in uh, civil structural design. That includes roadway, highway, utilities, drainage, hydro hydrology, and bridge design. Our expertise really is uh, it's pretty broad. And uh, our past uh, experience, successful um, projects include uh, Metro Expo 2, uh, Regional Connector, LAWA, um, MSC, and right now I'm actually a project manager for a Delta, um, Delta modernization project. We also have a pretty active uh, large call contract with, uh, with the Navy. I've checked out your uh, CIP and it seems uh, you'll have some needs in, for similar services in the future. And if you like, uh, we can discuss um, our experience with you a bit more in depth at your office or over lunch. Uh, can I get your card? That's it. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Sylvia Zhang. I'm director of HR and operation with um, um, Packrim Engineering. We are a consulting firm specializing um, civil and structural engineer engineering uh, for the clients like Metro, Port of Long Beach, and Caltrain, and in different sectors as well. We are a SBE, which is small business enterprise, but we focus on very quality quality service. So bigger companies like you know STB or other companies, the big guys want us to be a part of their team to provide excellent uh, engineering service. So if you want, I can share more information so I can follow up with you next week and we can meet at Cheesecake Factory or something. So I'll let you know. <laughs> I'll follow up with you. I'll just wrap with a couple of comments before I turn it back to Roy. So um, one one thing I noticed in here is we got we got to hit the wow statement. And so I, Marco, I think you did. You actually had some projects that somebody could connect to. Go, whoa, you did that. Um, some of the other ones were maybe generic. So if you talk about the process, yeah. But when you connect it to, we know the process, and that enabled us to get something done in 80% of what the original schedule was something that adds a little meat to it um, but I think that's true of all of them the the wow you got to think about what is going to make them go whoa not just we do this we do that we've done it for them what what stands out hands-on you you hit that point but then you related to an org chart which in the elevator guy isn't going to have your org chart so you know you're, it's 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 off the cuff not you know so but that was good and then and I would say one of the key things is, Travis, you know, you're writing it so it's easy to be formal, but you have to break it down into conversational talk, which I think just comes with a little practice. The last two points I would make are when you deliver this thing, you have to have conviction and enthusiasm. Because if you're going, well, we're with this company and we do this and we do that, and they're going, well, you're not very excited about it. Why should I be? But if you say, yeah, we do this, and you have a little, little energy behind it, they will sense the enthusiasm and and the truth behind it. Plus, that's an indication of what it's like to work with you. So, I'll give it back to you, Roy. Okay. Thank you, guys. That was a good job, especially for a short notice. Yeah. yeah. But I think y'all get the idea. Yeah. Yeah. I think the uh, the chance to, the, when when you get a chance to practice some of that, you're gonna refine it. You're gonna have almost a stock response to who you, which agency, which type of project, and then you'll be able to uh, get that out much more smoothly. I did want to jump on Peter's comment again because that is very common and I wanted to make it very clear. It's so easy for us to just sit back, right? And that ties to the point that I wanted to make. If you have an agenda when you go to a meeting, when you go to a CCA meeting, when I go, I'll look at the agenda, it says street improvement. Sweepy. Well, I know that is an upcoming thing, so I want to start on it. So who's going to talk, who's going to be there, and have a clear agenda and accomplish some of that. 
then you're active. If you go and show up and say, here I am, then you're not prepared. So when you prepare with task items that you want to do. I want to plant my business card to the Director of Public Works. I want to meet with the uh, sweepy leading firm, Stantec, who is a sponsor there. So I have a clear purpose of what I'm going to be doing when I go out there. So I plant the card. I say hello to this prime. Do a little quick uh, elevator speech. I open the door to go see them next week. Then you could relax the rest of the day because you accomplished all the things that you accomplished. But you got to have purposeful uh, thing to going in. Now, uh, this is, we're at 11.15. Do we need a break or was that a good enough break? Do you need to go party break? Yeah, it's, and I had a yeah. point uh, I wanted you to say. <clears throat> so when we go out there, all of us, right? Uh, we don't want to be passive. We want to be aggressive. However, we don't want to be obnoxious. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to be confident and deliver the credibility. But we don't want to bluff people. And that's it. That's a distinction we have to get it on, get, get correctly. Uh, and the, those are the things that uh, we, you know, sometimes we too passive, but we, we just waste our time there. Yeah. Uh, and I think to avoid that is my point, is to have what you want to accomplish at that meeting. Right? Do you want to meet five new people and you want to network next week? That's the purpose, right? So you have something to do. It's easy to fall back. And I think among engineers, I see more of that. When you go to a meeting, there are a lot of guys who just kind of stand off and you see them. And those are good targets to engage them. Because I think Peter and I, we believe in helping others to, and then we get help return uh, in the process. The call that I got earlier, I referred him to another general contractor yesterday and today I made them uh, speak to one another on the on the phone and it was an opportunity for him to pick up some TI work so he made connection he called me right away and saying hey thanks for that call by the way do you guys have fire water capacity so their opportunity just comes up in, tr in the process of helping people connecting others and you connect and it just surfaces right uh, so what was the consensus? Have a break or no break? Because this is an important slide. <laughs> right, we'll, do, we'll do this slide and then maybe we'll take a break because that's where it, it's more pertinent to you guys. This probably is the most important thing that Peter wanted to tell me 10 years ago when we were starting this company. We need to do capture management. And he gave me a binder. He uh, borrowed a lot of binders from Wildan, his old company that he doesn't refer to as much anymore. But it used to be the Bible of BD. And that folder floated in my office 10 years. And I think during the move, it floated back to his office. It just dawned on me. It's on the, underneath your uh, file cabinet. So it went back to him. But the important thing is capture management. And please read this because I think uh, that sentence that I was able to Google and find just says what it is. Everything company does to raise its win probability between the time it decides to pursue a contract and the time the RFP is released. Everything. Right? Whether you're charming, whether you're going golfing, whether you're meeting or face to one on one, whether you present your sample product to a show and tell, everything that leads to, and it's the capture management you could see from the pursuit to the RFP. And we could pack rim, we could do, we could improve on that more from the pursuit when we find out about the project. And then until the RFP comes out, we have to do whatever we can to increase our probability of winning. So, and then after that, I picked up from Sylvia, which is a great thing. When the RFP comes out, it's like doing homework. You have to get 100% on your homework. And it just dawned on me, RFP is now writing down what they say to write down. So the proposal putting together should be a cinch. But if we don't do a capture management, 
we don't have enough intel. We're already behind the schedule. When the RFP comes out, then our homework gets sloppy and the proposal goes out sloppy. So it's important for us to take this capture manager into our mentality as a PM and be able to pursue projects early, do our homework, get involved early, and then be able to increase our problem of winning. Okay? Does that make, go ahead. What do you mean vertically higher or lower? The yeah. effort, right? Mm -hmm. So I think what he's saying is if you wait too long in the blue, you're scrambling around at the end with a whole lot of effort trying to catch up. Whereas if you do it all the way through, it's a smoother, more, you spread more your air response when you get to that point instead of panicking and or the red is if you look at the red, you spend more time earlier. Early. Then just not spending any time in the blue, for example, until the draft RP is available. Basically you're spending zero efforts until the R draft RP versus the red you you you're talking to them more. Well, and that doesn't even speak to your chances. That just speaks to your effort. That's right. So yeah. when you wait to that point before your blue line takes off, everybody else is already ahead of you and knows more, and your chances have now diminished compared to the competition. This picture didn't show any chance in the opportunity to get the project right. No. Just, uh, just a short of effort. Yeah, it just, just says the earlier you start, you never have, your efforts are more steady and your results are better. I think the, go ahead, Travis. The chances are probably like this. Didn't you chance like this? The chances of winning to probably winning? Yeah. Well, supposedly, the theory is that it will increase as we start earlier on. This is the effort yeah. that is yeah, put into pursuing. As it comes, comes down to the RFP. Yeah. And other than this chart here, this is, this is like a BD thing. Uh, really is to speak to a specific uh, project <coughs> or opportunity. Really, if you look at the head of this, or opportunity ID and all of that, that's really for within the marketing arena, right? Mm -hmm. Is that uh, you're engaging client, engaging the market, you're trying to identify an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And those markets, as soon as the opportunity is identified, then the BD process kicks in. That's where this, this chart yeah. really has to be, be active. Yeah, and that's the capture management portion on the top of, um, the, right in the middle of the chart. That's where the capture management begins. So it is, yeah, it is my job to be able to look at the funding, what projects are out there, outline it, decipher which is a good for us to prime, which might be best for us to sub, what are the strategy, and be able to do that. And once we get to decide this is something we're going to pursue, then the BD effort happens. And it's normally with the BD guy, marketing guy, and also with the technical lead to show intelligence and capability uh, adding into that pursuit. So I think one conversation could be, uh, as a company, do we do enough of this? Mm -hmm. Or if we didn't do enough of this, why we didn't do enough of this? Yeah, that's a whole other uh, right. presentation and discussion that we could have. But we are just busy, right? And we, uh, it's hard for us to do a lot of that. But to be recent example that we did have, we did that well, I think in my mind, is with the LA County Public Works on call. We identified, he went through the website and looked at the project leads and was able to identify it's three contract for one cycle, three contract for another cycle. And we got the hang of that and we went to talk to the LA County. They identified and say, hey, these are coming out within a year. So then we put that on our list and then we met with more people at the county. There comes that four or five touches about that. And then we even went to the whole county staff to do lunch and learn some little marketing and also demonstrate our capability. And we wanted to have the our uh, proposal kind of written out a lot more, but we did spend time up front putting together the outline of the RFP and then we reacted and we were shortlisted and we weren't successful, but we certainly went that far 
uh, in the uh, not in a very short crunch rushing it but we took our time in preparing it so it's not a success as contract wise but as far as capture management I think it's a good example that we went through and I think we're going through that better because we have the resources we could relax a little bit and look ahead we don't need to think about what's ahead next month for us to work on we could look at what six months what year what two years ahead that we could look at right yeah, so that's an important add to that yes is that there is this process in dancing in it and for public works like you could identify that a year ahead in the land development world you might identify something way ahead if you're connected because you know that there's a hundred acre parcel of land for sale and you're watching who's maybe looking at that land and so you just keep an eye on stuff early and there's no indication there's any work and then you go meet with a few developers that might be interested in it even though they haven't even bought it but but the other thing is is if you're just looking at responding to the RFP and you're getting all that <coughs> meeting with the client and having those touches that's one thing you have to along the way figure out what is going to differentiate us not just Respond to the RFP. You got to say what response to the RFP is going to make us look different. Why us? Because everybody else is doing the same thing we're doing. So that's the strategic aspect of the capture management. There are such a wide gamut of information that you know people who've been exposed to it, especially these two guys. So many things to add on to. Yeah. So in my opinion, there should be like. Uh, little bit more effort shown uh, within that opportunity identification which means that that the slope should be a little you know steeper than, than being just flat whatever I that that's my thought okay to make it yeah. because that's my responsibility so I want minimum effort it's the scale that's yeah according to that we should put some effort that, that yeah, you, you, uh, yeah. Let me let me answer you that. This chart here is really, like I said earlier, is really uh, speak on the background of specific opportunities. And this chart here, it didn't really speak to the whole arena of the marketing. Yes, you're you're right. In order to get here, you have to spend the efforts to identify. So it's not really zero. That's a really marketing effort. That's a whole chart is going to be overlap on top of this, right? Um, that's third one, yeah. Correct. So let me just uh, analyze this a little bit uh, as far as our operations concern. What, where, where is uh, the strength and the weakness of our firm? Uh, for Patrim, actually we, we've done really well in terms of capture management. I mean, it's not like we don't do well. We do well because uh, uh, Royce is uh, constantly out there. For this size of firm, uh, you don't see that kind of uh, large efforts out there. So th this this red line is is good actually for <coughs> Pat Friend. So I think what is uh, lacking for us is this is this box. Right. Is how do we identify opportunity? We are good at certain things. We're less uh, efficient in certain. Things. We're good at identify opportunities as a sub. Uh, uh, we're good at uh, uh, opportunities in the larger projects, uh, which is how it reflects like a purple line two, three, uh, airport, whichever. Um, we're less proficient in terms of identify opportunities where we are a prime. For example, like County LA, uh, we just gone through, which is a very good example. That's how it's supposed to be hit, taking place. But those kind of opportunities are, 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 are less abundant for us and in terms of uh, identifying opportunities. So that's where it's hard because the market is so big. Uh, how much you, how much efforts, uh, 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 efforts you, you have to spread it out is, is difficult. The other part that uh, we are bad at is here is where <coughs> once RP let's say we have a, a early capture management or not when the RP is available to us we spike up obviously like everybody else we spike up but we spike up less 
the, the amount of effort requires to do the RRP, do the proposal. We listen. We don't have a good capture manager. We're supposed to be spend a lot of time to do this. Actually, we're, we're not getting it. We're getting here, kind of thing. Because so similarly, we don't have enough time and efforts to put in the proposal to enhance the level of the proposals to a point where you were competitive. If you have a perfect uh, capture management. Uh, perhaps uh, the amount of effort you, you need is uh, here. If you don't have a good capture manager, the amount of effort to uh, make it up has to be here. In either way, if this is a curve, we're not here, we're, we're kind of here. In this curve, we're, we're down here. The amount of effort that we'll put in there. So there's a two, to me there's two issues. The how do we uh, strengthen this box and how do we improve the hour on the money, like you said, the homework. <laughs> you got to do the, do the, uh, so complete, said that. complete the homework. Yeah. On the rivers and on the money. Yeah. And that's the part of where all was a scramble to get things done. And that's the uh, time crunch too. So that's why if we do early capture management, a lot of that should be written. Project understanding, the background, who's going to do what, teaming, all of that. A lot of that could be happening. So the ramping up on the blue could be less, but still there's a good chunk of effort. Yeah. We're not going to be doing this exercise just because uh, we're uh, already into 11.30. Okay, let me just make one more point before we move on. It. So this curve here, especially come to here, if the project managers are involved more into capture management, this becomes easier, mm -hmm. relatively. Yep. And that's a direct correlation because uh, uh, oftentimes in our practice right now, we are really trying to make this work at this stage. Uh, we've got a lot of people involved trying to uh, exchange the information, trying to move the information among ourselves. But if the PM uh, is a little bit more invested early on, then this scrambling becomes less. True. I hope uh, that's, if you don't understand it now, understand it when we're working on the RP whatnot. And I think only way to really experience it is if we spend some time on the capture management phase, then you'll see the difference and be able to say, hey, this process is a lot simpler, or a lot smoother. And I think uh, we're not doing this exercise of what are some capture management activity. Maybe that's similar to some of the things that we spent. But I do want to get into uh, this. Uh, if we need to take a break, we will. This one, I think, is something that's just another important thing. And it's easier, really, for you guys to uh, be able to uh, capitalize on this. So recently, uh, we had a guy who installed the network in LA. And he and I sat down, we chatted a little bit. And he was just telling me about his experience. So he's out on site putting together wires and network and talking to the client. What do you want done? Da, da, da. He's interacting with them. And while he's interacting, he delivered, at the end of the day, uh, a finished product. And during the process, he developed a relationship with this person. So this client ends up calling that person for an added scope, added work, rather than calling the sales guy, me, BD guy. Because he developed a relationship while he was implementing it. So as a PM, when you're at a PDT meeting, when you're making presentation, when you're interacting with at the job site, you have a golden opportunity to make that connection. If you show your performance and develop a good reputation, they're going to remember you and call upon you for a new task, new project. And if you demonstrate the capability that you are really well-rounded engineer, resource one, other opportunities that you have not shown, it would surface. And that is an important piece. You're out there, you have a closer relationship, and you have a less barrier to, uh, to do. So I have to set up a time to go meet with them, lunch or whatever. You are at a meeting. Show a few minutes early to interact and be able to 
do some pre-selling, asking what else are you working on these days casually. You're not trying to overpower a selling. You're there as a PM for that particular project and it just rises to say, hey, what's uh, some of the challenging going on in you know, your, uh, your office and be able to identify other projects that our company, our team could identify and do capture management on. And I guess the, the point is that you are able to do that. The reputation, the delivery that you do well on your project, for me, uh, I, have an e I think I do have an easy time selling out there because we're DBE and we, do, we have done great work. So it's easy for me to say we're DBE, we've done great work, please call. Please call our previous PM, see how we perform. It's an easy sell. Reputation, you cannot. With people now do call time to time based on what they have learned from other people and we're able to respond to that. So that you, what you deliver uh, in, uh, in reputation is important. Uh, on, as a PM, if you only approach that individual because you want something, you know, when there is no project, when the downturn of economy, you never market to them, you never visit them, you never call and say hello, and all of a sudden you call because you sniff out a project, that's a no-no. You want to be able to develop that relationship, especially with many cities that we do want an opportunity. You want to keep that relationship when there's no project, so that when there is a project, then there is something to build upon. Okay. Asking for a new project from a client, it seems like uh, it might be a difficult challenge, but it could be casual as what I just mentioned earlier. What's going, what else is going on? What's keeping you busy? And allow that person to share what they want to share, and you pick up on opportunity to follow up. Okay. Uh, Pre-selling, I think we hit a lot of that. Make sure uh, we are mindful of before we actually push it over to the edge, we want to do our homework, gather our, you know, gather our intel, and be able to say, hey, you have a storm order. I've done miles of storm order at MSC, design build that project. You're able to speak on it, so they know you're already, uh, com they're already confident in your capability, right? And then cross-selling, that's something that uh, Peter really likes too. But Rick had mentioned that he likes it too. The point is, you got to know what your company does in order for that opportunity to come up and to sell. So this network guy who does networking noticed in the conversation that they're thinking about upgrading their phone system. So he was able to know that their company does that. That's not his expertise, but he was able to pick up on that and call his company and say, hey, they're looking for an opportunity. Maybe you want to follow up with a call. So looking for an opportunity, but in order for you to hear it and identify it, you got to know what we do. Do you know what we do at Metro as far as structural civil concern? Do you know what we do at MSC and Delta II? Do you know what Rick is doing there in San Diego with all the Navy contract? We are touching a lot of peers. So in my mind, if someone's talking about waterfront work, I'm more confident to say, yeah, our group in San Diego is doing lots tons of peer work. So what, six of them? Yeah. But when you market, you say tons. <laughs> and this is a life-changing opportunity if you use us. <laughs> so knowing what your company does is very important. So we take interest in what your project is, what you're, you know, what you are, uh, what you're undertaking. Rick wanted to uh, have any input on this one? Well, I was just going to add one, one okay. quick point. It's it's two things, I think. One is what Roy just said, and that's understand what your company does. The second one is always having your antenna up. Mm -hmm. Because it's easy for a guy to mention a problem he has, and you just go, no, I'm not, that's not the scope I'm working on. So you have to connect that problem to something your company may do, even if it's not you. So if it's a structural problem, oh, you know what? We might be able to help you with that. If you, let me, let me call Gilbert, and I'll, I'll get us connected. Even if it's uh, it's even if it's not within house, helping that individual connect to another company who you trust that will deliver work, it's a good gesture because they'll remember you to be resourceful and helpful, and then they'll keep coming to you and they might uh, turn it into something. Peter, you wanted to say, oh, Travis, I want to so say something. So you had mentioned something when you say tons. Uh huh. Yeah. How 
what's the extent of stretching the truth versus lying? Yeah. Or what's, where's the fine line? Yeah. It's, 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 all, yeah. it's all in delivery. Matters. Yeah. So, like, at the Naval Station, you could say, you know, we're working on half the piers down there right now. Yeah, it's not. There's that's a lot how of you factor it. On half a dozen, don't be so specific. Half a dozen, even though it's an exact number of six, doesn't mm -hmm. sound exact. Yeah. You know, there's yeah. a lot of ways to say it. So, it's just the way you would talk with a friend. And I think the more you can treat business like that and be respectful in that, the more comfortable it makes it for others, and the more believable you are. Yeah. The, uh, we did an elevator speech earlier on, what do you do, and then you do that, right? What do you do? Another question they'll ask is, how big are you? And that's been the uh, nemesis when Peter and I started. When he was, he and I are two, and they say, what do you do? How big are you? <laughs> we have a group. <laughs> I can gain weight if that helps you. Yeah, that's a tough one, right? But where do you draw the line? You want to be able to demonstrate you have enough resource and capacity. So how do you best respond to that instead of saying, just two? Okay? We have the, he had his colleagues who supported, this is going back, who was willing to, at a notice, to support on projects, right? So at that time when we say we're six, we had resources of four other people besides us, not employees, but we didn't clarify that, <laughs> but we had the resources of six when we started, mm -hmm. right? When the company, he started the company, the name registered 1999. So when did you start? Well, we established in 1999, but we actually started incorporated Open Shop in 2007. But we don't go explaining all of that. We want some credibility. Is that lying? You know, I think we, you know, covered it. It's how you package that, right? PM. Uh, I think the uh, getting your antenna up is uh, is a very good point to remember. Takeaway. Um, I'm always looking for an opportunity to. See, can we do that? Can we do that? Now I'm just saying, okay, we want to do that or we don't want to get into that. But Antenna is up looking yeah, for opportunity. I have to mention, okay. <clears throat> where the first item is a seller doer type of scenario. Mm -hmm. uh, because the PM is the one really ultimately sells the job. Uh, in the interviews, they all look for PM. <laughs> they don't really look for anybody else. So how do you get into a point where you, in the interview, people are gonna believe what you say? It's all of those. Oh. <laughs> yeah, your, your reputation and your track record, and if that's why if you have worked with the PM on the other side of the interview panel, they have a good experience, they wanna work with you again. Yeah, that's it depends on process, <coughs> like, uh, yeah. It's a process, an experience. You've been a project engineer, now you've been a project manager once, a project manager twice, project manager three times. Before long, your project management uh, credential becomes a little bit more established in the market. And if you do a little bit more uh, tactfully, have the antenna of and to be more of a seller, eventually, you know, get, get it easier. It, it takes that. Uh, yeah, takes time, but uh, takes time. yeah, uh, we're going into more of a proposal phase and pursuit after the capture management, right? This is uh, we have improved on this. I think we have a process and we have gone through it individually and as a group to see uh, what uh, uh, whether we should go after a project or not. Uh, we have gone after a lot of projects. I think we could exercise a little bit more on letting go some of the things that uh, we're not going to pursue. And I've seen some of that too. Come recently coming from Travis to a general contractor before, if they invited us, we just say, yeah, we're going after it. But now we're able to say that's not the best fit for us. That's not our technical core competency. It doesn't have enough time. That project is too far. Whatever the reason, we have to go through the process to make the best decision, again, to win the pro increase the probability of winning, but also 
this last part. There is an objective to perhaps do a marketing piece of it. Rick and I were talking about San Diego on call. I said, are we ready? And Rick said, I think we're ready, but we're not expecting a huge success, but it's a process of putting our name out there in the agency that we could follow up if we're not successful to get a debrief. Our name, our project managers, deputy manager, all these people are marketed to that client so that next time around we're able to find to increase success. So on that note, some pursuits are decided even though it doesn't check all the box, we decide that it's a marketing purpose and we'll go after it. Some of the big items is the project funded, that's always important. And on that note, let me spin off the uh, thought of identifying projects. If you want to identify projects early, you got to follow the pot of money. Where is money coming from? Where is it sitting at? What stage is it at to be released, allocated? And once it's in the budget of a city, agency, state, federal level, once it's budgeted, then that's good projects to start pursuing. So if you want to do that high level, uh, funding is a key thing and, that you want to look for. And maybe another piece of that is, is it adequately funded? Because I chased or, or started to chase many projects over the years where you see the scope and then they say $200,000 is available for this project. And you look at it and you go, that's a $350,000 job. And then you have to decide, do we thin the scope down and then offer them optional services? Do we say, we're wasting our time because they're going to lowball it and we're not going to win? But there's a lot of unfunded, underfunded projects, especially like in the planning arena. You see a lot of that. But. Okay, so those are only some of the items that we would question, you know, have we been tracking it, do we know the client, do we know enough about the project, all this before the RFP comes out. Not our, by the time RFP comes out, it should be a no-go because we weren't prepared, right? But sometimes for marketing purposes, yes, sometimes we have a very strong client relationship, yes, or sometimes it's a strong forte of our uh, core competency so we go after it there are exceptions but there are a lot of uh, deciding factors that we should another key um, uh, key thing in putting together an RP and a winning proposal is uh, exercising uh, assembling a good team uh, and that's if you do it early then you have choices to pick the right teammates have them exclusive share information pursued together as a team rather than just one person alone. Okay? And the emphasis on this slide is just those two and probably more second part next to the dash in this slide. The more time that we spent on pursuit, on projects, the higher the probability of winning. Early teaming, early marketing, early client relation, early proposal writing, the more time we spent. Going back to the expo, we, as a small business, spent a big chunk of time early on when it was just a preliminary uh, uh, concept to be able to find that kind of success. And I think uh, early involvement uh, was the key. And then uh, good execution allowed us to build on top of that. So RFP assembling a team is an important thing. I wanted to uh, have exercises on this thing. What are some of the elements that make a good proposal? What you think in preparing a proposal? Maybe Sylvia could even chime in. Or maybe Sylvia summarized it. If not, I just wanted to maybe rush through because we're uh, coming close to end of our presentation. Maybe a few thoughts. What's a good proposal? Good underst project understanding? Uh, concise scope. Concise scope. Address and take their asking. But they request. How about getting us to the interview? Which is the next subject? I would say clear roles, clarity in the roles. The project experience is 
very relevant to what they're looking for. So our capability to provide alternatives I'm going to put it here. Project experience, relevance, and past experience. That is so important. They really want to know, you know, that you've done this extra project. Uh, understanding and approach. Right? Resume that fits. I used to just uh, always just, whatever we did, Peter's the best resume. Rail? Peter. Pedestrian bridge? Rail. Peter. It was all just that. Now we have choices. You know, you don't know how comforting that is. Like the fire water, I'm able to say, hey, do I go to Marwan or do I go to Marco? I think Marwan because he's, he's uh, wrapped up the uh, MSC. So you have choices now. It used to be always just one resume, right? Peter's folder used to be Peter Building, Peter Design Build, Peter <laughs> this, Peter Military, Peter Municipal. Now we have more options. This is beautiful. Resumes are important, yes. These are all. This guy who over at Sandbag had two slides, and these are some of the tips that he uh, presented. So I thought I'd share that with you. We could read it here, and then uh, you could have it for your reference. Supposedly, I haven't been on that side where I read dozens of proposals. But the guys who read it, this is what they see, and this is what they look for. So this is coming from SBCTA uh, director or chief whatnot, and giving some of these tips. They'll know whether you did your homework or not. Whether your team uh, is strategically created or you just grab somebody at last minute to fulfill that survey role. Right? Even if it's a surveys a DBE or has a relationship, has work on there, those are important things. And I guess they see it in the one day. Peter and Rick, did you guys ever be on the other side reading proposals too? I have. Oh, that's right. You work yeah. in the city a little well, bit. Well, no, I did it as a consultant at an as-needed contract with a redevelopment agency, and that was one of my Duty, jobs okay. for them was to help them okay. show this in the interview. Okay. I haven't done much. No, yes. once, I, okay. I can tell you one bullet up there that's really yeah, that's good. It'll, it's amazing. That's the fifth one. Mm -hmm. Check your references. Yeah. There are so many times where you put a reference down, the client calls that reference, and you know what the reference says, and they didn't do that good of a job. I'm not sure I'd work with them again. And that's because we didn't call and say, "Hey, can I use you as a reference?" Because if we did a bad job, the guy will be honest and go, uh, "You know what?" You might not want to use that job. Okay, good to know. Yeah. But you'd be amazed how many people have blown their chance because they didn't realize they didn't do a good job. No. As a, go ahead, Marco. I saw a lot of firms uh, show like preliminary conceptual design already. Yep, yeah, that's more money. Yep, it's on upfront cost. You're investing in it, right? To be able to uh, put that much. Yeah, these are all components of a proposal. Uh, I think some of them are uh, good points on what makes it a good proposal. If I could. Uh, we, I mean, we'll do these, reviewing our quality proposal, grammatical uh, on that. I wanted to comment on... So, what sort of areas are lacking? For us? For us, our practice, where where the lacking? Let me just serve a few things in my perspective. Go ahead. Where we're lacking. We're lacking chicken references. We don't call our reference before we put on reference. Sometimes even you know, the phone number is not correct. Mm. We we don't tailor our resumes. Uh, so we just threw resumes uh, in the last moment. That, that's what I like. We don't do enough uh, creative uh, concept exhibits. Sometimes we do, we, we, more often we do now, 
but uh, we're kind of forced to it. We don't have a, a good idea long enough to put out there. The number four thing that we don't do well is to be responsive to our piece. We don't really reach it. <laughs> you, know, you, you know what I'm talking about. We don't really our piece uh, back back, make sure we cover everything. Okay. And those, those, for me, those are the four areas that are uh, uh, a little bit inadequate. So a, a proposal or statement of qualification should be treated like a project. So this is a little stretch, but almost like a work breakdown structure. There should be a list of all the things you have to do and dates that you have to have it done by. So if it's update and tailor resumes by PM by this date. Those things have to be run like a like a project. Because otherwise you get to the finish line and oh, he hasn't got the resume done, he hasn't got this done, you're scrambling around and that's when you don't do your best work. So if you want to win, then you have to think of it in those terms. And then I'd say again, you have to do that when you get shortlisted. How do you get to the finish line in terms of preparation and rehearsal and all those other things? So that you arrive at the finish line prepared. You know? And I and back to that capture management curve, that's maybe because I know that's a traditional curve, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I would say at the end, I don't care how much capture management I've done, if I have an interview. I want to spike there again because oh, yeah. I want I've, I'm so invested in that thing. I want to give every best effort to be perfect. Yeah, and we've seen that. For it. And we've seen and that on that NAFAC. But pursuit. I think that's the difference sometimes of why you're qualified but you can't win. Why are we winning? It's not, and you might be more qualified than the others, but it's the ability to portray those qualifications in a competent, organized manner that has that impression right in front of them that takes you across the finish line. Yeah. The, uh, the point that I wanted to draw was the fourth one, review the ev evaluation criteria. Because, you know, if they, it's only 10 point on firm profile. We don't need to spend a lot. If it's 25 points on good understanding and approach, another 25 on the uh, concept alternative, we should know what our priority is in order to address it. Resumes, I think that's just given. People don't score resume on its own. That's just a backup that just needs to be there that matches. So uh, point well taken. But knowing the evaluation criteria was the point that I was trying to look for. After all that work, you go golfing, you go lunch, you go meeting, you identify a project, you do capture management, and then you go do the proposal when it finally comes out, drive everybody nuts, and then you have to go through this too, let alone execute the project, right? So this industry is a real difficult one. So what is the purpose of the interview? That's where I am told you make it or break it. If everybody's sitting on a fence, that's where you push that interview panel over to the edge to pick you. So this is a one live opportunity where you demonstrate everything that you told them and even <coughs> tell them better than what you have written. So it takes a lot more effort in a short time and it's not something you do fluffy and write it. You have to demonstrate it with your whole body and speech and reaction. So interview is where you win really the job. So it's, it's a peak if you're the interviewer. It, on paper, everything looks fantastic. When you're the interview and you're the client, that is a peak at what it's going to be like to work with you. How you communicate, how you interact, and that's what they're going to live with down the road. And I think that's why it's such a differentiator. Because they're all going, can I work with that guy? Yeah. Yeah. You know? The body language. And so, and the reality is they probably can, but maybe we didn't prepare enough to give them that comfort level. So yeah. that, to me, is is vital. I may add, uh, I think that most of the selections made on the interview, however, there is a case where the score interview after of RP for proposals together to make a selection. So when you go through this, you ought to know a little bit how this process works on this particular time, this particular job, right. project. And that will be the evaluation criteria, right? And the interview will be scored. It could be uh, starting from zero or it could be on top of your proposal score. 
But Sylvia has clarified it for me. Proposal, you should be, uh, there's no reason why you shouldn't have uh, A on that before you go into the interview. So proposal, we will much improve. So these were the exercise we want to go through, and these were just uh, one last line. How to prepare for interview. Practice, 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 and practice. A lot of practice going to that. And in sort of going through the exercise, maybe this is the second slide that Sandbag uh, Chief had put together. And these are some of his pointers that we would like to leave behind, and we could add our own uh, information. The uh, one that uh, resonated with me to, towards the end, and I left it on purpose, uh, on that is uh, when you bring your team in, make sure they have a, a role, purpose, while they're there, not just a one body. Okay? Anything that uh, particularly you are gravitating towards in any of these tips, or want to add to what not to do? Well, I mean, there's show that you're prepared. It's huge. Mm -hmm. There's that that will that'll relate to everything else. <coughs> on the on the interview, there are exceptions to that. I would say, if you have a huge as needed contract, and you're not certain about some things that may come up, you could potentially bring extra people. But you need to explain that right up front. You know, this is an as needed, and we recognize that you may throw a lot of things at us. We wanted to make sure we can answer any questions you have. And that's why these two folks are here. But other than that, they don't have a speaking part. Because I had been saved by that. I had an archaeologist do an interview with me once, and they asked an archaeology question. <laughs> and that guy gave, I was like, it was an amazing answer. Mm -hmm. And they loved him. And I went, wow, that, that was good. And um, that was you us have too. to be very careful about doing yeah. that. So that's uh, being prepared when uh, Port of Termini Y, when we went to that interview, uh, we brought in a sustainability expert, and he flew in actually for that interview from a big corporation. So um, competition's tough, but we're definitely making a connection there. And Mortensen is big; they do a lot of work. So Mortensen's <laughs> doing the uh, the Raiders Stadium in Las Vegas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if I can get us on that, but. And then um, our, our team um, was unsuccessful on the architectural. That was HDR and RJC. They were in a partnership. Um, Jacobs won that, but we have had some outreach to Jacobs, Roy and I both, and we're looking to sit down and talk with those guys about maybe wiggling our way in there. And then there's just a lot of little things. We've got um, proposals out for some work at Wyndham Hotels. They've got some violations. But beyond that, they have a lot of renovations they want to do. So we've got a foot in the door. And um, we've given them the first proposal. And we're waiting to see what happens. But I can see it. That client owns a lot of hotel property. Okay. Based on the best in Maryland. Yeah, so. One thing is not here is uh, the Army Corps IDIQ uh, in the Sacramento oh, district. Oh, yeah, well, you guys have that here. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So we, we, we did. When that, uh, right, I saw. Burn, yeah. Burn yeah, yeah. It's up to them. That's good. And they've got the rates. They're working out the rates still. Yeah, no, that's great. That's a good one. So there's a lot of things going on, and there's a lot of there's a lot of other outreach that's that's not here. We we have a constant outreach with like Burns and Mac and Brown Caldwell, and um, besides Jacobs, we're um, WSP. We've had some interaction with, and we got on their team for the IDIQ, and then. Um, We've had some meetings with landscape architecture, so we're out, you know, trying to step up our game a little bit. But you know, it's it's hard to balance that with how busy you are. But one thing I found is when you're busy, that's the time to still get out there because if you wait till your work ends, there's a very large gap before you find work again. So you've got to keep things in the hopper, and probably on that capture thing, you probably have to be hunting. Throw eight projects into that hopper to come out with one on the other end you know, or two. It's just the way it is. So so we can we can never rest on that. <coughs> oh that's the end of the uh, all the well, slides. Go ahead. Coming from the Navy though. Yeah. And they're um, calling with some really weird um, questions and advice when I was up at uh, Point Magoo the other day. He was asking me about capability to do some modeling for this laser target. So yeah I think we could help you we could do this and that and informally on the side, worked out kind of the budget for that. 
and now they're putting in and they're getting the money approved to send Good. this stuff to us on top of some other work. So it's kind of like you were saying, um, somebody trusts you, Peter knows someone they call because they know they'll get the job done, whether he does it himself or not. Mm -hmm. And that's how they treat us. They just call us for stuff whether they don't even care if we do it. They just know if we go to them, they'll find a way to get it done for us. So that's increasing what we're doing. So yeah. that's good. Cool. So being out there, uh, BD Marketing, knowing that our company and our staff, you guys, and all the guys who work uh, with you, do a good work. And I, non being non-technical, having that confidence is a tremendous help. So continue to do a good reputation of doing good work, and we'll find success. We'll continue to find success. Thank you very much for today. We'll go have lunch. All right. Thank you. Thank you.